I'm gonna go through all of the must have tools and equipment for set building as a photographer or videographer. This is actually part of a much bigger workshop where we go into actually building the sets, but this section here is just about the tools. I'll pop a link below to the whole workshop, but enjoy this bit for free. Now, before we build a set, there's a whole host of things that we're going to need. First of which is in my hand, and this is safety glasses. Now, this is not just a, don't be an idiot and sue me because you chopped your finger off and poked your eye out. We're photographers. Our eyes are very important to the craft that we do. If you're drilling, if you're screwing, if you're painting, wear safety glasses. Get a bit of paint in your eye, it might seem like not a big deal, but if you get an eye infection and you can't work, it suddenly becomes a bit of a nightmare. So safety glasses, absolute must. Get those on. Yeah, it should look a bit weird, but we're photographers anyway. We all are a bit weird. I'm gonna take these off for the rest of this video because they are filthy. Now, firstly, don't go and just buy all of this in one go. Some of it you might already have. If like me, when you started photography, you didn't own a screwdriver, some of it maybe not. We've got a whole host of things. There's better tools out there. There's worse tools out there. Don't worry too much. You can do this job with the cheapest like tools you can find. You don't need to buy expensive stuff. We're not professional set builders. We're photographers who do a bit of set building. Let's start with the power tools. We can get those off here. Now, like I said, I had no idea about tools at all. I just didn't understand them. This is a drill. And for those of you who are more like me, this is an impact driver. This is for screws. This is for making holes. They look like the same thing. They appear to do the same thing. Yes, you can put a screw in with a drill, but this is what you want for screws. Buy one of each, thank me later, you'll stop ripping the threads and like just destroying screws and then having to drill them out. Impact driver, this is perhaps the most used tool in the studio. We're always screwing stuff together and unscrewing it. Buy one of these, battery powered is always best. I don't know if you can get mains powered ones anymore. So, but a battery powered one of these, it, it just stops everything from going horrifically wrong. Get a couple of batteries as well, because we all know when you need to use something, the battery's flat. So a few batteries for those. I've got matching from the same brand. These are just DeWalt, they're fine. Um, they weren't too expensive, they weren't too cheap. They use the same battery, which is really good. This is a hammer drill. This is an impact driver. Put screws in, make holes. We need both. We often drill pilot holes for the screws, especially if we're doing like a really big building of set. So these can be very useful. The, these are like daily use tools in here. Um, one, we build the studio with them, and two, we build the sets with them. So yeah, definitely get some of these, get some decent drill bits, good to go. Don't buy a big, <laughs> and this is a pro tip because I've done this, don't buy one of those mega sets of drill bits and screw things, they're rubbish. Buy them bit by bit as you need them. Um, it, it's just they're much higher quality and they'll last you for years rather than for a job. Whole stuff. Next up, you're gonna wanna chop some wood. Now, we have a circular saw here, but it's currently gone back to my mate. Um, and that is what we normally use to cut big bits of wood. Often though, hand sawing it is better. And the reason for this is the circular saw makes a lot of mess and we're in a studio. This makes less mess. So often we'll just hand saw something. It's rare, and, and this is important to note, that all sides of a set need to be perfectly cut. So anywhere they come together and often we'll use the bit of wood that has been cut by the shop for those areas. So this gets a lot of use, very good. Sometimes we want to cut a bit faster and we use this. This is a jigsaw. Again, you can get a cheap one of these, some decent blades, and you can like slice along. Very useful bit of kit. We don't use it very often, but it's like sometimes the bits of wood are too big or they don't have the right size in the shop. So we'll get this and we'll just slice them up. Don't need it urgently, but it is something I use. So I just wanted to put that in there that yes, we sometimes use a jigsaw. Now, much like drills, hammers come in many different shapes and sizes that I didn't know. You're going to want a claw hammer. Um, again, it's not the most, it's not as used as drills and screws, but every now and again, we do need this. But what you really want to buy if you don't own one is this, a rubber mallet. If you need to knock things in closer together, but you don't want to leave massive dent marks in them, this is the tool for you. If you've got two sets and they're all held up and you just need to knock it along a bit, instead of kicking it, rubber mallet it. It's a much better way to do it. So these are really good. And again, it's a tool that you didn't know you needed if you're not a DIY kind of person. Very good bit of kit. 
So that's pretty much the, the you know, the, the proper tool tools bit. We're gonna get onto the other stuff in a minute, but the, you don't need too much. I think you can get by with a handsaw and a drill. If you're gonna buy a third item, buy an impact driver for the screws. It just makes life better. You don't need power cutting things. A handsaw, you can cut a really straight line with a handsaw. Um, and often what we'll do is we'll get a nice straight piece of wood. We will clamp it down and we'll cut along that piece of wood. But you know, most of the shops you can use nowadays, they'll cut the wood to size for you with beautifully laser guided circular saws. Just get them to do it. You don't need to build an entire workshop to do this stuff. But you do need some clamps. And as we're talking about clamps, let me show you the most used clamps. Now, of course, I have every clamp under the sun in here because I'm a photographer, but there are some clamps that are just very, very useful. These ones here, which are the sort of speed clamps with a ratchet on them, where you can clamp stuff together and use like a pistol grip to do so, are very good for when you've built some sets and the wood isn't quite straight and you want a, two pieces to join together, clamp them together and they come straight. This is just very useful. The same you want to hang it on a table and just really make sure it's not going to go anywhere. These are very good. We have a lot of these in here. You can buy these from charity shops. They're always going cheap in charity shops. Or this one brand new was three pounds. You get them on Amazon, eBay, whatever they are. You don't need anything special. Metal rod, plastic bits here with a pistol grip. This will do you a great service. Very useful bit of kit. Maybe buy four of these. I mean, I've got loads of them all over the place, but they're, they're very, very useful just for holding sets together. Then we have the Humble Super Clamp. This is a photography piece of kit. This is something you want to be buying anyway because they're very useful. I think I've got about 10 of these. Buy the Manfrotto ones, don't buy the cheap ones. As you can see from the state of this, this is a Manfrotto one from the 1980s, I believe, from the studio I got it from. They're just bomb proof and they just last forever. They're really good bits of kit. And we use it if we need to get a C-stand to hold a piece of wood like this. And you'll see this later on in the video, of course, so don't, don't panic if it's making no sense yet. C-stand goes in here, plank of wood comes in here, and you can hold it. They're good load bearing and they've got great accessibility for all of the kit that we use in a studio anyway. And these, these are really good. These are just little clips that you get. These are by WorkPro, but you can get them anywhere. On Amazon, you'll be able to get like a job lot of all different sizes. And let me show you what these are good for. You get your C-stand. There we go. You get your boom arm. And if you need to hang your sheet of paper, just take two of these over the top and just hang your paper on it. And then you want another two at the bottom to weigh your paper with. But these are super, super simple bits of kit. They cost nothing, but they get used on every single shoot. Really useful. What, $10 and you're sort of, you're good to go. And I apologize because my currency is gonna be interchangeable. I know we have like a good percentage of American viewers here, so I keep saying dollars and, and pounds. It, you'll be able to work it out. Now with C-stands, there's two types of C-stand you need to have. This one here is a mini C-stand. Let me just lower it down to show you. That's it lowered. This is a mini C-stand. Very good for holding A1 sheets of paper to a table because with the, the big C-stand, it's often too high up. The big C-stand, very useful for holding set walls up. So mini C-stand down here, big C-stand at minimum length up here. It's quite a big difference. You kind of need both. I was late to the game on the mini C stands. I mean, if you're hanging a piece of paper portrait off here, let me show you. So you take your paper, you take your clamps. Like this, we're good. But when we go landscape, it doesn't quite work with the table. So if you're doing a portrait background like this, beautiful bit of kit for the job. If you want to do it landscape, you're going to want the mini, obviously with a longer boom arm on it. This is a mini boom arm as well. Now, another very important tip, the ends of all of your light stands, you take one of these and you put this on it because whilst you're moving around, you're very likely to poke your eye out. This is just a bit of eye security. And yes, I know I'm probably coming across as a bit paranoid. If I damage my eye, I'm not going to be making a great deal of money. So also very important to keep these things like, they're your number one priority in all of this. In terms of the general background sort of building materials, I use a lot of plyboard. This is five mil plyboard on the ground here, which we've just painted. 
we just keep painting over it again and again and again. We don't bother sanding it, we just paint it and it will become apparent later on. These here, A1 bits of card. About 350 GSM, doesn't really matter because again, we do a lot to this in post, which we will also get into. But this is uh, the backbone of all of our set building. It's either paper or it's plyboard. Whether we're doing a massive set build or just a tabletop shot. I've got a whole stack of them in the corner. We just get them out and we paint them. And I'm gonna show you how to paint them as well because it's, it's straightforward, but, but also not straightforward. There's some tricks to this. But this is a, a very like key part of set building. And then what you will have noticed as a trend is a lot of these structural shapes. And again, they're nothing fancy, they're just wooden boxes. But finding them is difficult. Now I'm gonna tell you where I get these from. These are from Mad Props. They make these beautiful shapes like this. This one here is just a wooden box off Amazon. And the other place you can get them from is Pixapro. You can also get a host of acrylics like this, which you can use to cast shadows, to sort of diffuse shapes. Again, very useful, but it's like kit. These are all from Mad Props. They come in different shapes and sizes. We've got some circles, there's a circle plinth in there. Got some nice circles with straight lines. It's all stuff you buy. You can make it yourself and you can also commission people to make it. So you can also commission people to make it. It's very expensive. I'd only do that for a job, but for test shoots, I've got a big box of these that I've collected over the years. And again, look, this has been painted for a shoot. If we need to shoot again, we just paint it again. Now, the way we paint these and the way we paint the backgrounds is very different. And that is what we're going on to next. So these are foam rollers. So you can get a fabric one, but it obviously leaves a massive texture. These foam ones leave less texture, still too much, but less. So let's get those and give it a good rolling. Foam is the way forward. And then in terms of the paint, I tend to use, unless there's a reason not to, I tend to use a matte blended paint. So I'll go to my local hardware store. You give them a color to match. Of course, this one's pretty much empty and they will mix that color for you. Now the problem with this, well, it, there's many problems with this, but the main problem with this, if you're getting a paint matched, it will never look like the thing you're matching it to. It just doesn't. So say for example, I am photographing my blue squeegee and I want the paint to be this color. I'll get it that color. They'll mix it as close as they can when in the, in the pot, it looks kind of different. And then on here, when it's wet, it looks different again. And when it dries, it looks completely different. So don't expect to get it perfect, but it will be pretty close. And that's the paint we use for this. Now, of course, if I start rollering one of these over the years, these little cracks are just going to get absolutely filled up. And of course they will do regardless, but with a roller, it's going to be a nightmare. So what I like to use is this up here, it's called Montana Gold. It's a graffiti spray paint, it's really good quality. And often what I'll do, if I'm gonna have the set and the background the same color, I'll take this with me to the paint guys and go, can you match this to this? And they seem to be able to do it better than from an object. So that's what we use for this. Well ventilated area when painting with this stuff here, it is rather toxic. But again, look, it's a great finish. It, it does a good job. This is my recent test shoot beautifully covered, takes a few coats, and whenever you're painting, and this is even more important for sort of set stuff, when you're doing the roller, it's thin layers. I'll probably do three to four layers on a background to cover it properly. When you're spraying, it's from a distance, and it's probably going to be four layers with drying time in between. One of the benefits to the spray paint is they dry so quickly. So we'll often be like on set going, oh no, we need an extra different shape here. Set stylists will get this out, good old shaky shake and give it a lovely coating. And it's just such an easy and fast way to do it. But, and big but here, I have a workbench area over there. The fumes will fill this studio. The paint dust goes everywhere. One of the things we're doing when we build our new studio is having a dedicated painting area. Don't use paint near your cameras. All of my cameras have like the dust from the aerosol on it. It's just, it's a nightmare. I don't have a better system for now, but do as I say, not as I do. If you can do them outside in the garden, do that. Absolutely brilliant. Let's get rid of this stuff. So before we get onto these, as you can see, I use one of these to store something else. 
For many years, for food photography especially, we shot with tablecloths and napkins, and, and that's kind of, you can still do that, but it's kind of dead. But for fabrics, a lot of what we use are these sorts of velvety materials. Just buy them down the market, they're not too expensive. You know, they're, they're always, you know, they're great. We use these a lot to add texture with a like a real bold graphic color. So we use these on a Christmas shoot recently, and of course, I'm gonna recycle them at some point and use them again. We've got a whole load, curtains off Amazon on special offer. Just, you know, a real mix of like bits of fabric, very useful to have. I don't do anything specific with them, and again, it's the pegs and the C-stand often that we end up using, but these are great. So I'll just get these out of the way for now. This is where the, oh, I've lost my cloth, hang on. This is where the fun fun happens. Some sets are designed to be invisible and it just holds the substance. This is a custom built tank. This is a bit filthy from a shoot. This is Mr. Muscle window cleaner. Other window cleaners are available. These are what we use to shoot liquids with. Now, this here is a really cheap, clear plant pot. This is rubbish. I'm gonna put that there so you can see it in comparison. This is a custom built fish tank. And again, these are expensive, unfortunately, um, but you need it to hold the liquid. You can get cheap things like this, but you need something that will really hold the liquid. So just give us a quick clean, and again, shooting with these, the main thing is cleaning it. Um, and I'm using a cloth it's not a microfiber cloth, it's actually a cloth designed for cooling people down. So you cover them in water and then you put it around your neck to cool you down. It is much better in terms of actual cleaning. Microfiber cloths, they leave microfibers on them. I know they're not supposed to, but they do. So a bit of window lean, one of these, and there's a reason I've got these different fish tanks out here and, and let me explain it. This is what I, well, what I bought first was double the size of this. And I was like, that takes a lot of effort to fill up. This is smaller, we'll do this. Then I bought this one a bit smaller, and then I was like, how much depth do we really need in a fish tank for liquids? The answer is not a lot. If you fill this with water, and it's not that big, you can't lift it off the table, you've got to siphon it out, use a pump, some horrificness. This here, you pick it up and pour it out. Um, and it's just acrylic, any acrylic workshop near you can knock these up, acrylic and glue. We use these for the Greg's coffee shoot, so we had the coffee in here. We poured the milk in, and the whew, did its thing. These are brilliant, I love these. Unfortunately, I broke a lot of them. I had 10 made, this is my last one. They're not forever pieces. But this is great if you wanna shoot liquids and also look. Imagine this is full of liquid, how much light has gotta to get to the camera. With this, you don't need as much light. And if you know anything about shooting liquids, you need a short flash duration. Short flash durations require a low flash power. So this is brilliant. I didn't know it existed. I didn't know it was a thing. A brilliant set stylist called Charlie Cave got me onto it. Um, I'll see if I can find a link of a generic place that does it worldwide. I doubt there is one, but if there is, I'll apply it. Now on top of that, sometimes we don't need to see through, but we need a vessel for water. And this here is a paddling pool. Every photo studio has a paddling pool. This is what we do if we need to create a swimming pool. This is what we do if we're gonna do something really messy, we'll get the paddling pool out and put the table on top of it. Anytime water's going to go everywhere or we need a body of water, it's a paddling pool. We need a river, paddling pool. It's a lake, it's a beach, the paddling pool. It's always an option. Now these are the basics here. There's so much more you can do. You'll notice from my portfolio, we often use soil. We'll use fake ice and stuff for sets. There's a whole heap of things we can go through. And I'm actually gonna go through my body work and tell you exactly how each set was built as well. But these are the fundamentals. And what I'm going to show you now is how to use these bits of equipment to build some sets, because that's where the real magic happens. <laughs> Dale mi negrita baby baila Ese cuerpito de tequila y playa Que maíta en bikini soleata Bien cabrón cuando baila rebaja 